In this video, I'll discuss some of the design principles I use to design an automated cable reel. So what you can see on the screen now is a cable reel I designed in SOLIDWORKS, but the principles will be applicable to any CAD software. Josh, come oh, Josh, come on, look at this. This system was designed for a five millimeter cable spooling for fi uh, 500 meters, so half a kilometer, and it evenly spools it over the section of the drum. So the first question to start with is why would you want a system like this, which evenly spools or neatly spools up a cable? Why, why make it overly complicated, if you will? So let's just look at some example pictures so one application could be an underwater um, vehicle that has some sort of cable uh, connecting to it so this cable could either be used uh, for communication purposes uh, or like a safety tether if the system say isn't an autonomous system and in the worst case needs to be pulled back so you might yeah might have some safety or communication tether attached to it uh, likewise, you might have some land vehicles. So I believe this is a pipe crawler vehicle, uh, like a robot that will travel down a pipe for inspection purposes. And again, that might need communication and a safety tether. So on this system, it actually looks like there might be two separate um, tethers there. But yeah, the, the design principles are the same. And also you might have some industrial machinery where and nut needs, needs to slide back and forth along some axes in a um, cyclical manner. So if we didn't have a system like this, which evenly spooled the cable and didn't come back and forth, it would most likely get messy and not be as space efficient as it spools up. We wouldn't have consistent layering uh, of, the, of the cable and we would need a bigger cable drum and probably we would have to use a narrower one because there's no way it would move along the whole width. So it could be done, but it just leads to a much more compact and space efficient system doing this. So I'll go through this design quickly and some of the principles. Obviously this system greatly depends on how thick the cable you're using is. So as I mentioned, I in this application, I used a five millimeter thick cable. So that's about one-fifth uh, of an inch and the length was 500 meters or half a kilometer or about one-third of a mile. So as you can see I have some of the cable cut away here just for uh, demonstration purposes but obviously when this thing winds up it would start from this inner cylinder and wrap around these inner rods to make the first layer and then as it goes uh, more and more, that whole inner cylinder would fill up and it would go out and this outer cylinder of, of cable loops is the, the maximum um, diameter that the reel would expand to. So one useful uh, bit of information to look uh, when designing this is a drum capacity calculation. So I got this from the Shores website and I'll, I'll also link this uh, below for information. Essentially what this gives us is the required dimensions we would need the cable drum to be to get a certain length uh, of cable wrapped around that drum. So we get um, a certain K factor here which is dependent on the diameter of the cable and we can use that to calculate how big our drum needs to be which is what I did in this uh, scenario to give these dimensions so jumping straight in I've got a motor here what motor you use depends on the torque and speed requirements of your uh, scenario so let's say we're looking at the application where we have some sort of underwater vehicle I suppose in that application, in the worst case scenario, say the system breaks down and has a power failure and we need to pull this thing back, 
we could calculate what force we need on the cable to retrieve this thing. Uh, likewise in a land robot application and we could maybe also calculate how fast we want to pull that back. So we can use that number to give us the force on the cable we need. And then from there we can calculate the torque on the drum uh, as we're rotating to give that required pulling force. So just keep in mind that that force um, will change depending on how much uh, the cable has wound up because if it's mostly wound out and we just have this inner cylinder here, then the perpendicular distance from the center of the drum to the uh, cable outside cylinder is smaller than if the cable were fully wound up. So when the cable is completely wound on and the distance is maximized, uh, it will change the torque and the speed. So just, just keep that in mind. And in my application here, I decided to use uh, some gears to give a mechanical advantage. So the motor here is driving this smaller gear, which is a 30 tooth gear. Uh, linked to a 60 tooth gear. So it gives a mechanical advantage of two to one. So it's increasing the torque uh, on the on the drum. So in that case, yeah, that, that's just what we needed for this application. So we also need a slip ring, which is a crucial component in this design. Uh, I have it here in my model and the slip ring is what allows electrical signals or power to pass through a rotating joint so if you're not sure what a slip ring is you can look that up but we used um we we just had our basic ethernet comms passing through here so we yeah had the central slip ring passing in and it actually passed straight through that large gear which had a large bore in it and then from there just connected to the cable through the cable gland and that would begin winding up uh, on the on the drum spool so the drum is supported by bearings on either side as we can see here and it links to a small pulley which is connected to a large pulley with a timing belt so this is also a critical mechanism if you will of this design, the timing pulley links the rotation of the larger cable drum to this smaller screw in a particular ratio. So this screw is kind of the essence of, of this design. It's a self-reversing lead screw. So normally a lead screw has one um, spiral cut through it. So as the lead screw rotates, the nut connected to that lead screw will move in one direction. But a self-reversing lead screw is actually pretty interesting. So it has, as you can see here, I've highlighted one of the cylindrical cuts, but it has another set uh, of cuts which link into the fur. So as this nut, so the nut is uh, just down in here. I have some other parts attached to it, which I'll explain in a sec, but as this nut gets to the end of the screw, it actually moves into one of the, the, the other groove cut into it and will begin moving back in the other direction. And that's without actually changing the, the rotation of this screw. So the screw will just constantly be rotating either clockwise or counterclockwise. And the nut will just constantly be bouncing back and forth between the, the end. So I just found this animation of a self-reversing lead screw, which probably gives you a better understanding than my explanation. But we can see that the nut is following one of the spiral cutouts. And then when it gets to the end, it slots into the other cutout and moves the opposite direction without the screw actually having to reverse. So here's, a, so here's another video of that. So this is super useful for this application because it allows us to link the rotation of this screw
back to the original drum uh, and it gets gives us our, our layering movement. If we didn't have this, we could have a secondary motor linked to this screw and we could possibly have limit switches on either end. So as the, the nut hits one of the limit switches, it triggers the motor to reverse its direction. Uh, but obviously that's a less efficient solution because we have an additional motor there and a set of limit switches and more things can go wrong and it would be more expensive. So to calculate the pulley ratio, here we first need to consider the pitch of this screw so in this case i believe it was a 25 millimeter pitch which means from in one rotation the nut moves 25 millimeters or about an inch and as i mentioned before the cable is five millimeters thick so for every rotate one rotation of the cable drum we want this lead screw nut to move the diameter or the thickness of the cable. So that way as you know, the cable makes one wrap around, this moves one thickness, one width of the, the cable thickness and so on and so forth, which results in a, a tight, compact layering of the cable. So this lead screw, I believe was 25 millimeter pitch, which means for one revolution, the nut would move 25 millimeters. So we actually want this to only rotate one fifth of a, of a total revolution because one fifth multiplied by its pitch uh, is one fifth by 25, which gives five millimeters, the diameter of the cable. So here we can see that we have a pulley ratio of one to five. So this small pulley has five times or this large pulley has five times as many teeth as the small one i can't actually see how many teeth they had but this this means that w when this small pulley rotates once the larger one rotates one fifth and that gives us the specific uh movement we need for layering in this application now i just wanted to mention actually one issue we ran into was we actually designed in the exact specific uh, pulley ratios we needed to get that five millimeter movement but we found that the nut was actually slightly lagging the rotation of the the cable uh, what i mean by that is that once this thing was going for a while it, it was no longer staying in line that the cable was was sort of jumping ahead and eventually it got out of sync and we found that was because there was actually a slight gap that was left between the cable layers. So in the CAD model here, I modeled it up as though they would uh, wrap tightly next to each other. But we found that in reality, there was a slight gap of about um, 0.5 to 1 millimeters, about 5, 10 percent gap between the, the layers. I'm not exactly sure why that happened. Uh, probably like something to do with the geometry of how close this guider was to the cable but it was something that was difficult to predict um but we found yeah there was a, a slight gap so we actually had to come back and change the ratio so that the nut moved a bit more than the thickness of the cable instead of moving five millimeters it moved about 5.5 millimeters so to do that we actually just ended up laser cutting this pulley out of plastic like we had a machined one uh, but we needed to change the ratio slightly to fine tune it. So we just laser cut it. And that was actually fine because these aren't really load bearing. Uh, even when you are pulling like a force back on the cable, the load is transferred into the rods and the drums and the, the supporting bearings. There's no real load on these pulleys. So that's something to, uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, if you're prototyping one of these things or building one of these things, you might have to optimize uh, before you sort of like were to produce many models of this uh, and yeah the last maybe last mechanical aspect was a encoder wheel so we have an encoder here and this was linked to a knurled metal wheel which would make contact with the cable and yeah rotate as the cable was pulled out and this allowed us to measure exactly how much cable had been spooled out. So if I go back to one of these examples, like a, a pipe crawler robot, 
this would let us know how far into the pipe the robot is. Uh, obviously, you, you can't have like encoders on the robot's wheels itself, but they were very prone to slipping, especially in a wet environment. So the, the encoder on the cable reel actually gave the best estimate of how far the system had traveled. And we actually, I actually did make another mistake here in that there was no support under the cable here. So the weight of this knurled metal wheel actually caused this cable to sag down a little bit in the final model. I'll see if I can actually show you this in a video of the system. So, so this is the system running that I built uh, from that CAD model. We can see here the motor driving gears underneath the cover and we're getting nice spooling of the cable. Small pulleys rotating, driving a timing belt, driving a large pulley. And that's moving the self-reversing screw at a specific rate such that it's moving in line with the layering of the cable drum. And just going back here, you can see the encoder, uh, it's, it's hard to see in this image, but it was causing the cable to slightly sag down. So that was actually giving a slight error in the distance reading because we want to measure the distance of the neutral axis. And if the cable is bending slightly and we're measuring that top surface of where it's bending, we're actually measuring a slightly smaller uh, radius uh, so we, we fix that later on just by putting another piece of Teflon underneath the cable at this entry point. And these were just Teflon blocks um, to guard the cable to prevent it from being pulled up or down uh, too much for the specific application. Besides that, we had a battery here. I believe this was just an electric bike battery that we would plug in to power the whole system. Uh, a motor slip ring and some elect basic electronic boards um, just to drive the motor, read the encoder, whatnot. We had two buttons uh, for powering on the system and retracting the cable. So in case of an emergency, we just need to hit it to start retracting. And in, our, in this application, we designed enough torque to actually be able to pull out our, our robot back that this was attached to and a ethernet um, comms port. So we would plug a computer into this and that would pass through and connect to our robot. So this cable acted as a safety tether as well as a communication tether. And if you are using it as a safety tether and you need a certain load rating, uh, just make sure you're getting a cable specified for that one, which has like an outer shield that can withstand that load. And just a word on manufacturing, um, a lot of these components were machined out of aluminium. Some were off the shelf components where possible to keep the system cheap. As I mentioned before, the self-reversing lead screw is a specific part uh, that was crucial for this application. Uh, we did find, I did find a supplier um, from this website, Robot Dig, that supplies them for a very reasonable price. Because they are very niche specific components, they're not there's not too many supplies of them and they can often be very expensive. But yeah, we, we kind of just got a stock one and machined down the ends to interface to some bearings in our application. So if you'd like access to these files, or maybe they could help you with a similar project you're working on and you could adapt this to a similar cable reel for your scenario, uh, please look in the description below. Uh, I offer the files on my website and you can support me in, in doing so and in, in purchasing them. If you have any questions about this design, feel free to ask any questions in the comments or shoot me an email. And if you like this video and you've learned something or you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up because it helps it reach more people. So thanks for watching.